Welcome everyone to the 36th Salon, The Gift of Water in the Maternal Gift Economy Breaking Through series hosted by Genevieve Vaughn and the International Feminists for the Gift Economy. I am Leticia Lason, your moderator. We're happy to have you with us today. And we are very excited to have Reverend Aria Marie Sharp, Guadalupe Urbina, and Maria Suarez. Each of our presenters will have 15 to 20 minutes, which will give us ample time at the end for questions and discussion. So let's begin. Our first speaker is Aria Marie Sharp. She's an interfaith minister, artist, chef, and ceremonialist. Most importantly, she is one of the two priestesses at the Sekhmet Temple. She's a visual sound artist and a private chef in venues for over a decade, serving Las Vegas and several other locales around the world, creating recipes of visual sound and art, prayerful cuisine, and sacred scent honoring the earth, sacred sites and ceremonies. Gratitude for 25 years of education, nourishment, and encouragement provided in Las Vegas community arts projects, music, song, group ceremony, and women's circles. Living and perpetuating arts of sanctuary. That space that lives, that, that space, the place of all love and grace honoring rites of passage and practices that offer sanctuary of essence in reciprocity with all our relations. There's a much longer version of her bio at the website, but with that, I would just like to welcome Aria. So Aria, thank you for joining us. Good morning. Grand Rising from uh, Cactus Springs, Nevada, which is about an hour north of Las Vegas, and it is homelands to the Shoshone and the Paiute. So this morning, I um, just want to talk a little bit. So uh, grateful to be here. Thank you, Genevieve and Leticia and Maria Suarez and Guadalupe Urbina and all of you who are um, attending today. And, you know, here was an offering about the gifts of water and how that uh, plays a very large part in our everyday life, considering that most of our body is made of water, most of our planet is made of water. I tend to come at it from more of um, what could be seen as the spiritual um, approach, but I think it's actually just an approach of the earth, uh, approach of the indigenosity of this being, whether it's roots of Africa or Cherokee or Blackfoot or actually Germany, which most people wouldn't guess. <laughs> I feel that understanding some of the roots where I come from has, has sort of paved a way um, and opened a path for my relationship with water, um, which has many, many uh, gifts to it. But what I would like to talk about first is just the water receptivity and how it responds um, to engagement, to engagement with um, all beings, but in particular with uh, the human being. And we'll say like, um, we can use for reference uh, the, the text from um, Dr. Masaru Emoto. Some of you might be uh, familiar with his uh, messages um, with water and it, it, it speaks to the fact that when you actually talk to water, if you sing to water, if you pray to water, and it is of a positive affirmation or something that is healthful and, and uh, of wellness, then you see this beautiful crystalline, almost snowflake in the water molecule. When you speak to that water um, disparaging or with... Um, harmful intent instead of um, kindness, 
then it becomes almost uh, mutilated in how it looks. So one of the many things that I have enjoyed in ceremony and offering ceremony is the offering of my water, my water, your waters, our waters. And so to sing to you in gratitude is to sing from my waters to your waters, my emotional body to your emotional body, emotion, energy in motion. So if I look and I say, thank you, thank you. I'm so grateful for you. I'm so thankful for you. There feels to be um, an expression and an admission of that love, of that gratitude, which can be felt by others. So I would love to do um, a small meditation with you, an invitation to honor the waters because water ceremony um, in my life is very important. So a, a simple saying thank you to water. Um, we can look at um, Dr. Gerald Pollock, the fourth phase of water, um, which has some compatibility to what um, Dr. Emoto was saying and takes it further and understanding like that, that more dense fourth face of water is more gel-like and it actually is what is called structured water, which is one of the things that seems to be most healing for the human body. So if I'm singing to you and I'm putting in a positive intent, then I'm offering my structured water to you. And then in reciprocity, I feel like this is a very, um, a very strong healing modality for the species that is, is, it would be wonderful to see more and more studies. Uh, the exercise I am thinking of is actually a Qigong med, med, um, exercise, which in um, I do study a, a medical Qigong, so as a medical Qigong practitioner. And Qigong, which is the internal arts, it is an internal martial art, you hear of Kung Fu or Gong Fu, that is external, has to do with strength, motion, agility, whereas Qigong and Tai Chi is the internal and it speaks to the internal um, subtle bodies, which actually is like direct conversation to the waters. So the gift of water that I really have come to um, share of one of my practices, which is honoring the water of the body to help in self-regulation in our um, daily life some things, there's a lot of stresses in the world. And so any modality that is a, a kindness to this body, this mind, <laughs> these emotions, I say, hooray. <laughs> and it's a very simple practices by saying, thank you. It's a gratitude practice. So, and I invite you to take a few deep breaths and just feel your seat beneath you feeling your feet on the floor or your tailbone. And as you breathe in and breathe out, as you breathe in, feeling your feet connect with the earth, feeling your seat connect with the earth. And with every, each and every breath in, feeling the essence of the earth coming up, up through those souls, up, up through that seat into the heart, grounding the body, in this space, this place of love and grace, and drawing your attention to your crown and feeling your crown open, just slightly opening, opening, opening to the universe, to the sun, moon, and stars, to all that is unseen, unknown, unformed, and highest potential. I'm feeling that energy come down, down through the crown, past the galactic eye, to swell in the heart, marrying heaven and earth within the body. And as you breathe gently, I invite you to feel your hands and to rub them together until they are warm. And just rub them slowly, thinking 
with the intention calling in that which is sacred water, water that is life, honoring the soul of water, the being of water, and knowing that that energy is generated in the hands and you might see it as a deep, deep blue, warm, warm, salty ocean water. And when you feel it start to tingle, I want you to think of that, that energy as almost a gel, like a blue, deep blue, salty gel. And breathing gently in and out when you're ready. You're going to place your hands onto your kidneys right behind your navel and drink it in breathing in that water if it's uncomfortable to reach for your kidneys you can put your hands directly on your knees and gently rub your knees for that is another access to your kidneys and as you breathe in feel that warm salty gel filling your kidneys, the waters of life, encouraging health and wellness and warmth of being, and just sort of rub your kidneys or rub the top of your knees, saying thank you, thank you, sacred water. Thank you, sacred water, for water is life. Thank you for this gift of renewal. And breathing gently, perhaps then bring your hands to your heart to settle the energy and the last of that precious water. Honor that to your heart in gratitude for beating for this life here and now. We say thank you, thank you, thank you. And I invite you to bring your attention back to your feet feeling them solid on the ground, feeling your seat solid on the ground, your crown connected to the heavens and where they meet and marry within the heart, unified heaven and earth with the sacred waters of life. We say, thank you. We say, thank you. We are grounded and connected, sealed and protected in the love that is water, that is life. And I, I invite you to just take note on how you feel right now and the difference um, before this small meditation. Just feel whatever it is in your body and take note. Does it feel better? Does it tingle? Is it warm? What are the sensations? So as you sit with those feelings, I'm introducing you to this beautiful um, drum that was gifted to me. This is called an, an Udo, and it is a ceramic African um, drum that is utilized specifically to say thank you and to call the waters. So the sound that it makes is like the water drops. And just for one more minute, just resting in that place, that grace of beauty, of water, of structured water, of your intention of putting in beautiful water energy into your body, into your kidneys, into your heart with gratitude for water as a being and how, how, it, how she sustains us, how all of the water goddesses sustain us. Thank you, we love you. Thank you, water, for all you do. Thank you, water, clear and bright. 
is light. Water is light. Water is light. Blessed be the waters of life. Thank you, thank you for your infinite gifts. I look forward to um, sharing more gifts of water with our upcoming panelists, um, Guadalupe Urbina and Maria Suarez. And I just offer deep, deep gratitude for the deep waters in this life and how they can bring joy, how they can help self-regulate our being from the crown to the ground and back up again. Blessed be. Thank you, Aria. That was very beautiful. My kidneys and the waters in my body feel very relaxed and with a nice flow. So thank you for getting us ready to be open to the next two presenters. And we'll have more from you at the end. Our next speaker from Costa Rica is Guadalupe Urbina. She is known as a singer and a composer, but also as a researcher of oral tradition in her region. She has ventured into painting children's stories and poetry as an extension of her musicality. She has four books published um, in Costa Rica. And Guadalupe, with her efforts, has performed on various stages in all three of the Americas, Europe, Central Africa. And there's a much more extensive detailing of her works on our website. She also has recorded 10 albums and her music appears on collections of various labels. So welcome, Guadalupe. We're so happy to have you with us. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure for me to have the opportunity to share with you um, what I'm going to talk about, the water in the Americas, the, the sacred waters in our cultures. Um, I will begin saying that the founding tales have always validated human existence, but there are also terrifying urban legends that give credence to our deepest fears. Our traditions finally have defined us. For the original cultures of Latin America, myth and legends have has been strongly linked to nature and wildlife. One of the most crucial protagonists of these legends was the woman. The arrival of the Spanish invaders created a new society that told its own stories based on its monotheistic and patriarchal religion. And I mean, that doesn't mean that there were no patriarchies in pre-Columbian America, we had. But here is the monotheistic religion that in their narrative discourse denied the importance of women in the Americas. The prophets, they, they were prophets or gods and, and in, omnipotent, imperialist and unique and most are born of virgins and thus free mating is condemned. Our place of importance within tribal societies was taken away from us in all aspects of the life. The place of a woman in these stories is varied, but it remains fundamental so much so that even though our present is demonized, we remain in the popular imaginative to this day. Early Mesoamerican, the region where I come from, the early Mesoamerican calendars are female, especially the Mayan calendar, and keep track of lunar cycles to govern agriculture and female reproductive cycles. The first Mayan calendar, the Cholquich, is a double feminine calendar founded by grandmother Shmukani 
and has continuity in the granddaughter, daughter-in-law is kick. Um, this is the agricultural calendar par excellence. The new readings of history already give the place to women in Mayan culture as precursors of astronomy, agriculture, pottery, basketry, and medicine. But we don't have to go too so far at this moment. Mother Earth has returned to our memory and our lives again as the Pachamama of the Inca worldview. And her strength is so great that she is already acclaimed in many parts of the world. Pachamama is a fertility goddess who not only presides over the harvest, embodies the earth, the mountains themselves, or causes earthquakes. She is also the mother of the sky, the mother of the sun and the stars, the indigenous tribes that populate today the Andean regions that stretch across Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, Chile, and Northern Argentina make sacrifices to Pachamama and attribute immense power to her. In almost all founding stories of the cultures, of the world, there are common symbols that represent women and some are key such the moon, the snakes, the water and the felines. Four symbols totally linked to women in our lands. This also explains the demonization of animals as important as the snake. Of all the cultures of the world at the arrival of the monotheists that is linked to the rise of patriarchy. In the Americas, the snake due to its shape and movement is related to the water of the rivers and therefore as the mother of the life that the water gives to us. This is the mother of everything that moves. I've been thinking about uh, water in our lands, in, in cultures around the world. And, and water receives many names, but there is an emblematic one, which is vital liquid. However, when we talk about the culture of people, we measure it by monumental construction. But we are not asking about the relationship of these societies with water. Today, I would like to talk about Aboriginal water. Ab origine is a Latin grammatical expression, which means from the beginning, which refers us to the most remote antecedents of people, events, or things. The water that comes from the beginning, the water that the has the possibility of regeneration of new humanity, as narrated by the visions and sacred books of different cultures in Nuestra America, Abia Yala. There are several categories to analyze and define the history of humanity. For example, anthropology has terms like lithic culture, textile culture, jungle culture, culture of fishermen and gatherers, etc. And history has a stone age, an iron age, blah, 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 blah. And being water, the vital liquid par excellence. Hydraulic societies or civilization have not used to build categories. The way in which water was managed or cared for, and that has to do with the fact that it is closely linked to a vision and understanding of the world where the feminine is deeply sacred. Today, a technological and economic development is bringing us closer to the limits of growth and balance. They are taking us deeper and deeper into the risk society in which we are immersed. But there is a growing gap between the power and a scientific technical apparatuses regarding culture and the contribution that indigenous people and women have made within the civilizing process of humanity in a balanced relation with our planet. All societies have had and still have a water culture. In those cultures, the imaginary cannot eliminate us, even if it demonizes us. It's for the reason that I will that I would 
uh, tell you some short stories because uh, I, I have made a selection, a short selection of short stories from different uh, cultures, different people based on the role that water played in their lives and very particularly bringing back some of our goddesses. In addition, through them, the moment of the emergence of patriarchy, visible through violence that eliminated these matrilineal communities and matriarchies. And um, I hope that you can understand everything that I say with my um, English. I, I, I will begin with one of the most beautiful tales. I adore this tale. And it says, it, it, this is the Gauchoban tale. In the beginning, there was the sea. I want to say first in Spanish. En el principio estaba el mar, y el mar era la madre. Y así, ella era río, laguna, quebrada. Y así, ella estaba en todas partes. Ella no era animal, ni vegetal, ni piedra ninguna. Ella era a luna, el océano de arriba, del pensamiento y la memoria, y el espíritu de lo que iba a venir. Por eso la madre de los Kogi, que viven en la Sierra Nevada de Colombia, se llama Gauchobang, que quiere decir el agua que está en todas partes. In the beginning there was the sea, and the sea was the mother. Thus she was a river, lagoon, a creek, and thus she was everywhere. She was not animal, nor vegetable, nor any stone. She was Saluna, the ocean above of us full of thoughts and memory and a spirit of what was to come. This is why the mother of the Arroacos, the Kogis, who lives in the Sierra Nevada of Colombia is called Gauchoban, which means the water that is everywhere. The goddess Tlatecutli, with her feline claws in central to the Aztec vision, Life arose from her when she sacrificed herself and therefore the cosmogony of the cycle of life, death, and the earth as the devourer of corpses and giver of life permitted the way of understanding the world of Mexica society. But on the other hand, according to contemporary archeologists and anthropologists, legend tell us that Tlatecutli was the monster full of eyes and mouths all over her limbs, which, is with, which beat incessantly. The gods Quetzalcoatl, feathered serpent, and Tezcatlipoca, smoking mirror, transformed into great serpents and tore Tlatecutli in half. Her body produced life as we now know it. The same happens with Coyolchauqui, who reigns in the 13th heaven, the highest heaven, with her mother, Coatlicue. Coatlicue was the great midwife, teacher of sex and pleasures. She and her brothers discovered that her mother was pregnant with a son who is with Silapochli, and he has the father's name, and that he already has power on his own. That means that he determines of the, the offspring. Faced with this threat, Koyorshauki and her brothers plan to kill her mother. But with Silapostle, who is almighty, just a superhero, at birth, kills the 400 warriors and throws Koyorshauki from the certain heaven to the underground. And when her body falls, she was dismembered. And I go directly to the Yakumama. The Yakumama is a, is this word come from a Quechua voice. Yaku, water, and mama, mother. Yakumama is the mother of water. It is a gigantic snake similar to the anaconda, but much larger, reaching around 50 meters in length with a head two meters wide. She inhabit the mouth of the Amazon River and the lagoons near to the river between Ecuador and Peru. There are those who say that the Yakumama is the protector of water sources, a protective spirit of the Amazon with overwhelming natural force like that of the river. She hunts there in the rains and her roar can be heard from afar. 
When she moves out, the watershed leaves marked long trails in the jungle due to her colossal size. These legends and mythologic creatures that relate and accord us to water and life can be found in different tribes and native people of all the Americas, but especially in the South, in the people living close to the Amazon basin. In South uh, Colombia, the anaconda or water snake is the Milky Way when descending to earth from the Amazon river and its tributaries from which all human beings emerge. For the Huaoranis of Eastern Ecuador, a giant anaconda guards the entrance to heaven. For the Quechua of Pastaza, it is the strength of Sumi who controls the powers of the waters. For different native people of the Bolivian lowlands, she is known as the Hichi, a peaceful deity guardians of the waters and giver of the origin of life, also associated with the stones, the stars, and female fertility. Other varieties for the myths around the giant anacondas in the same Amazon area refers to the Sachamama, which means mother mountain. It's a huge black snake that is very slow. Reading these stories, I can see easily the hint of the patriarchy around these stories through the years. Another vision of the Yakumama says that to get food, she powerful jets of water through its mouth and that can knock down trees when she moves on land. And if a living being is less than a hundred meters away, she can suck them up. However, when she reaches a certain size, it is very difficult for her to move. So she chooses a clear place in the jungle at the foot of the river where she waits for the arrival of prey, especially human beings, which she hypnotizes with her penetrating eyes to be able to hunt them. This unleashed terror on the Yakumama. I can continue talking about a lot of stories, but I want to tell a story that I I was surprised when I, when I heard about this story of Bachue in the Lagoon of Iguaque in Colombia. The Iguaque Lagoon is located in Boyacá, Colombia. According to Muisca legend, the goddess Bachue came out to the lagoon with a child in her arms, her mother and her son, her consort. They are considered the ancestors of the entire human race. The Iguaque Lagoon now, with its cold landscape, was once filled with colorful flowers and plants. The water began to bubble as if it were boiling, and beautiful, a beautiful woman with long hair appeared. In her right arm was a five-year-old boy. They welcomed the water to the shore. They were Bachwe and her son. They came to populate the earth. When the child grew up and was a man, he married Bachwe. They had many children because in each childbirth, she had four, five, six, and even more until 20. They first settled in the savanna and then traveled throughout the Chipcha empire. They populated every corner with their children. She taught her, creators to weave, build huts, can eat clay, cultivate crops and work metals. Her husband trained warriors to tell them the values and defense of life and territory. When Batre considered that the land was sufficiently populated, she arranged everything to return to the Iguaca Lagoon. Accompanied by a crowd, she returned to the place from, it, from which she left and in the company of her husband jumped into the water and they disappeared. Sometimes later, Bashwe and her husband became a snake that came to the surface and traveled through and in the presence of everyone, leaving us as a message that they would always accompany them. The Iguaca Lagoon became a sacred place 
and ceremonies were held there in honor of Bachwe. Chipche society was governed by matriarchy. Therefore, the name of his husband is unknown. The woman was in charge of, tra of transmitting the traditions of customs to the descendants, the man protecting the territories. She was considered a goddess, but also a teacher to whom they owed the type of organization, their traditions and values of her cultures. He was considered a god and a warrior. And we can continue talking about the legend of Dorado, Eneguata, Vita, Lagoon. We can continue talking about the, the native people from, from the Yara, from the rivers in, in Brazil, um, the mermaids of little rivers of fresh waters. We can continue talking about the importance of water in Costa Rica for the people Bribris and Cavecars and the whole different native groups, what it is sacred. And we can talk about the duality in our deities. When the Spanish people came, they could not understand that, that our, our deities had two faces, that Ometecutli, the Ometecutli had the Omeziwat, the lady of duality, the lord of duality, Ometecutli. In Costa Rica, we have Cebu Sura, but now they disappear. Sura disappeared. It's just a symbol of water. And Cebu is the most important god. So um, I hope that I that I told some, some things that can be interesting for you to continue looking for or to, to learn a little bit more about these cultures related with water and snakes. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. And Guadalupe, I do hope because the names of these goddesses and gods are so important to know that you might allow us to um, put up a copy of your paper or a glossary of the names with the recording so that we can actually make sure that we know how to identify them in the future. That would be wonderful. Those were great stories. Thank you so much. It's beautiful. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yes. And I hope, well, you know, after we hear from uh, Maria Suarez Toro, that uh, perhaps you'll grace us with a song later. All right. Yeah. yeah okay. Beautiful. We'll have we'll have you sing and then maybe we'll have Aria sing again and maybe we'll have Jen sing if she feels up to it too <laughs> getting all of our waters going all right so our next speaker is Maria Suarez Toro she is a feminist journalist and activist in defense of human rights and an educator she was born in Puerto Rico but has lived in Costa Rica for close to 50 years. She was the co-founder and co-director of the Feminist International Radio Endeavor, also known as FIRE, from 1991 to 2011. She has worked as an educator in literacy in many countries in Central America during the 1970s and 1980s. Since 1998, she has been an associate professor of communication at the University of Denver. Since 2011, she's been a correspondent for Haiti, Puerto Rico, and Costa Rica for the news service for the women of Latin America and the Caribbean. I think one of her most recent and most interesting things that she is doing these days is that she's dedicated to the archeological diving and recovery of the history of Afro descendant population on the coast of Costa Rica. And I hope that she will share more of that with you. So a more extensive bio of Maria is on our website. So Maria, welcome. And thank you for joining us from Costa Rica. Thank you. It's great to be here. 
And I am looking at the list of people who are uh, connected to this and looking at many known women that I haven't heard of or seen in many, many years, and I'm really excited. Um, I am going to uh, connect what Aria and Guadalupe have said to how we are claiming and I could say bringing up today these issues that they have raised about the ancestral, the historical, and the critical perspective regarding water and women in the planet. As an activist, I contend, like many others in the world today, that we have, as, as a species have reached our biological limit. And therefore, every time that we contaminate, destroy, predate, market or commodify life gifts that are meant to be free, or deny and violate women's place in history of the planet as water, we are reaching or committing suicide as a species. The planet, as Elizabeth Sautorius, author of Gaia, Human Journey from Chaos to Cosmos said many years ago in the Earth Summit in 1991, the planet, the rest of the planet, will probably do better without us. It is us who are in the verge of stopping to exist. Naomi Klein says that we are angry because we are not the ones who have been responsible for this depredation and the destruction of our possibilities of continuing to live in the planet and I agree with her that there is anger, but I contend that alongside the anger, the larger part of humanity that has not created this place of death reached by humanity, we are afraid and isolated. And that fear and isolation is what characterizes today the fact that we don't even know how many human beings, communities, and peoples do not agree with the present day policies about destroying our very own capacity to stay and live decently in this planet. Fear and isolation have to be dealt with not only with information, because today, more than ever before in the history of humanity, all kinds of information flow freely to a point where we cannot even listen to it anymore. When that happens, and anybody who has been really isolated at some point in our lives, and most women have, some kind of experience, we know that overcoming isolation and fear has to do with connecting to the life forces that Aria and Guadalupe were talking about. Connecting to the basic relationship with water. And it means connecting to our first dive in an interactive symbiosis with the women who birthed us. That is the connection that I am hoping that we can all tap into to be able to overcome the fear and the isolation that we have been submitted to. Let me, before I present to you the, the latest experience that we are developing in the Caribbean to try to do this for our community, for women, and for anybody who uh, is close to our experience here, where I understood the relationship with the waters, planets, my and my own body very early on in my life as a diver when I was probably between nine and 12. 
And I remember diving in front of my house in Puerto Rico in an amazing reef that had these prairies of um, algae that the turtles love and the currents moving them in a swaying dance that also has music because the ocean has music. I have heard that music. And I remember staying with my snorkel, staying kind of paralyzed. At that time, I thought it was paralysis. Later on, many, many, many years later, and I understood that I probably went into a trance because it was the, time, the first time in my life where I felt so deeply that those currents that were moving, everything that I was seeing and that surrounded me was also the currents that were moving my blood in my body. And I also felt very strongly that the warmth of the Caribbean water that I was diving it was the same warmth of my blood through my body. That experience was so strong that I came back home. And when I came back home from diving with a family of six kids and my father and my mother, who are also ocean people, we used to talk and talk and talk all at the same time, I still do. And I was very quiet, I couldn't say one word. So my father asked me if there was anything wrong. And I, I explained to him, I said, no, that I had an experience in the water that I cannot even talk about. And I spent about two days so quiet that he thought that I was sick. And every time I have gone back diving and I cannot tell you how many dives I have done in my life, whether it be scuba diving or snorkeling or just swimming. Every time I pray to the nature that I can live that again. And I have lived it many times, not in the same way, but in the connection that I have as a memory in my body, in my soul, in my imagination and my spirit about that day when I went in a trance and understood the connection so deeply that it has stayed with me forever. Therefore, my process more recently at 74 has been to try to help anybody to connect in the way that they can to that life uh, building experience that came from that connection. The most recent one that I will present to you and Diane, maybe you can put the first um, slide because I'm working with my cell phone. Very recently, just two weeks ago in Costa Rica, we organized a float in the um, parade and festival and uh, of the International Day of Afro-Descendant Populations. And alongside of the story that um, Leticia asked me to tell you about the search for sunken ships, which I will not say talk about today, but maybe the next time when I have to talk about voices, because Genevieve and the gift economy have invited me to talk again on the 15th, so great. So now I'm just gonna talk to you about the latest experience of trying to bring together in today's um, experience in our community, what Aria and Guadalupe explain a lot better than I can. And thank you for not asking me to sing it. They will sing it. But it was an experience where we decided together with a group of um, divers and Afro women that we would organize a float that was going to be about rendering visibility to the goddesses of African descent and Bribri and, and, and Quebec descent that Guadalupe talked about, to be able to bring them to the uh, ex cultural experience of the parade and to bring them in the embodiment of women from all walks of life in our community. And this so the saying that is there in the first picture 
we come from the sea, we are the sea, is something that has come from a character that I created that is called Tonaina, which means sea light, and the work of the ambassadors of the sea finding their own roots, men and women of Afro descent in the sunken ships of, um, in the Cahuita National Park that has brought them to the origins of their identity as Afro descendants with the history. And we are trying to connect that with also another project that perhaps will be called or is being called Oceana with Guadalupe and some artists about the role and the place of the sea in our identity and our identity as women. So if, if you can pass the slide, this was the first time that the Costa Rican Caribbean ocean was represented in a float. And you can see it from a drone here. And presenting the women presented themselves as ancestral goddesses of the founding cultures of the coastal community afro and Quebecer. if you can pass the slide. So what we did is build a float that was a boat that uh, had the lion fish in it because it's a, an invasive species of today, just like Guadalupe explained the invasion of patriarchy that uh, diminished and almost rendered women invisible. And uh, the float was moving with a car in the front, it said Tonaina, they are the sea, the women are the sea. I cannot tell you because I was driving the car, how many of the 8,000 people that came to that uh, carnival stopped the float and stopped my car so that they could take a picture of that really struck a chord in most of the people there. If you can pass the slide. In the back, we had, we came from the sea, we are the sea. And then we had music and we had a frame that would bring in the bottom of the ocean so that people could be able to see it, what we are finding in the bottom of the ocean. But behind that float, and you can move the next one, you can see, white um, umbrellas. Those are the enactment of the goddesses by women of all ages, of all ethnic backgrounds, and of all walks of life, walking each one with an umbrella that had the name of one of the African or Bribri and um, Kabekar goddesses. And the girls were in the float because they couldn't walk that long. Can you pass? So you can see it here in the middle of the Carnival, past the slide. And then we had the, mu with the music, uh, one of the music that is most liked right now in that celebration of the Afro um, International Day is a song that was born in Costa Rica out of a song by Guadalupe, Vengo de una Tierra, and a song that was uh, interpreted to include other singers of the the Afro descendancy in all of Costa Rica. And if you can pass the slide, it's, I just picked up two parts of that song that has been the most liked uh, by the people since it was um, launched last year and this year's celebration also. I come from a land that has the warmth of its plains and seas. I come from a burning land that is only for people that know how to feel, that want to live. And then Kawe, from Africa to Costa Rica, we are the same black people. History tells us the truth that we may know we have the same roots. Can you pass it? So the collective journey, the captains of the collective journey were the women. The women dancing in the streets, the women enacting the goddesses and the women expressing their own ancestral tradition. The tribulation of the journey the younger generation of girls with the goddesses marching with them. Can you pass the next one? I, you know, I keep talking, I forget to tell you to pass them. Can you pass them? Yeah. The girls and then the next one. I'm not gonna, and then behind the boat, 
Okay, and pass the next one, please. The guardians of the goddesses. This is what called the most attention. Because not only because they're beautiful and amazing, but because the goddesses were guarded by guardians that were women. The next one. No, oh, no, no, the previous one. Sorry, Diane. Okay. And then the goddesses in the ever-present journey back to the waters of life. You can see there the names of the, no, you can't see them. Well, if you have a big computer. No, you can go ahead, Diane. Those are the guardians. Just pass three more slides. And uh, next. Yes. And then the next one. And now I'm going to present to you a few slides about how this was prepared by the women who enacted the goddesses. Uh, Yemaya appeared in white because that's the color of Yemaya. And she's the main goddess of the Yoruba and she is the goddess of the waters. Pass to the next one. So two women wanted to be Yemaya, more than two, but we only had two. So we had two Yemayas and that was really great because people kept saying, wow, she can be whoever she wants. And the women were also talking about how they could be whoever they wanted by dressing up. A retired, next one, retired elder, Lidiet. She represented Aya of the Yoruba, which is the goddess of the forest. So she had all, all her, her outfit was amazing because it had all of the traditional healing plants and in her head, she had a hat of, hat, hat of all of the um, forest plants that are healing plants. And she was a, yeah. The next one is Alana. You can pass to the next one. Alana is a young four-year-old girl who said to her mother, when she heard her mother talking about uh, becoming one of the goddesses, and the guardian, she said, I want to be, I want to be a Viking goddess because I know I have Viking blood. So she became a Viking goddess that was able to walk in the identity that she chose for herself. Next. And her mother was one of, next. And her mother was one of the guardians. And the following day, next, next please. The following day in Kawita with her daughter, her mother became a goddess and she also became a goddess. I think I'm getting a call from you. Are you able to listen to me? I'm gonna continue. So <clears throat> Kawita's entrepreneur and activist Alana's mother, Leda Villa, was one, organ, one of the main organizers of the goddesses. And she took over her granddaughters, Freja, who was the name of the Viking uh, goddess that she represented to shield them all. The Janira, the bread maker of our community. Can you continue? One more. One more, Diane. The Janira, the bread maker of the community in Kawita became Allah, the goddess of the underworld and guardian of the crops. Asaseya, Ashanti goddess, was represented by Marianita Harvey, director of social action of the University of Costa Rica. The reason why I'm presenting you with what they do is that what they do and who they are was enacted in the goddesses when they began to learn what the goddesses stood for and began to choose which one they wanted to represent. So Yansa, the Yoruba Orisha of the water was represented by Sanda Blair, a tourism worker who is the goddess of the hurricanes, the storms and the wind that cleanse the planet. Next. Oshun, the next. Oshun, goddess of the fresh waters, was Yara Wright, 
She is a young ambassador of the sea. That means the scuba divers, Afro and Mestizo scuba divers that are looking for their Afro identity in the bottom of the ocean in the untold histories told by Tonaina. And I claim, because I saw and felt that, that when I saw Yansa and Oshu, Yansa as the, the goddess of the fresh waters and Sandra, Yansa as the hurricanes and storms, a gust of wind freshes the hot and dry day in Puerto Viejo. Mau, fond goddess of the moon, Tully Williams, when I interviewed her, and you will be able to see this in, in uh, videos that I will tell you, that I will show you. She, I asked her before going on the streets, what she felt about, did she feel comfortable being Mau? And she said, totally. She is me and I am her because she's goddess of the changing moon. And I identify with her because I change moods all the time and people criticize me. And now I know it's right. Iridia, if you pass the next one. Bri Bri, goddess as Guadalupe explained, is Hade Quiroz, a very young mestizo tabeca woman, elementary school student, who really enjoyed becoming so many women because it gave me strength, she said. And Sulara, the cabeca, the, the sorry, the bribery goddess, Hilary Morales as a bribery mestizo, also elementary school teacher and recently apprentice of scuba diving with ambassadors of the sea, claimed that she loved it because now she realizes that with the diving and with the culture that we develop with the diving, she becomes a stronger, she develops a stronger identity. Tonaina and Aja, when they met each other, they recognized each other as survivors. So there was a song by Frank Murillo, who is part of the Oceana Initiative that we are putting together as an artistic expression. His song is really very interesting to the gift economy. He's the only man that talked in this whole slideshow. And he said, women are the sea, the Bribri, the Cabeca, the Ashanti, and the Yoruba are the sea. They came from the infinite. And like a mirror of the sky, they have gifted many good things in life. You will find in the slides below two videos about it. And I wanna thank you. And I wanna tell you that our hope, but not only our hope, but what has happened even to us who organized this and now are going to continue meeting with these women and are organizing a, a festival of the ocean in the Caribbean uh, with many of the artists that um, I was talking to you about of the ambassadors of the sea and the community that we have come to understand together with Guadalupe, the artists and the divers that in order to tap into that basic relationship with the waters of life that started with our diving in our mother's womb can help us transcend the fear, the anger, and also the isolation that the powers today and the policies in today's world are trying to put us in to keep us disconnected from each other, from the planet, and from our history and our culture. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. It was so beautiful seeing all those images and the embodiment of the sacred goddesses of um, Africa and the local indigenous goddesses. That was very, very beautiful. The word that really popped out to me that you shared, um, that you spoke about, Maria, was symbiosis. You know, that word, that biological term to me mm -hmm. is such a much more um, uh, intimate word than interpersonal and interbeing, mm. the psychological terms that we use, because it's it really is about this um, 
connection, this biology that is about the um, coming together and supporting of one another, a symbiosis that can't happen unless both are together. So I love that word, my favorite. One of my favorite yeah. words from uh, uh, Lynn Margulis. She has written mm -hmm. a book about symbiosis. Yes. Right. So thank you for that beautiful presentation. I love the slides. And um, I, we've reached that moment where now, uh, if there are questions that I hope uh, Liliana has been watching for or comments. And um, before we open it up to questions, I wonder if, Jen, did you have any words you wanted to share now and you don't need to until later? Well, I'll just say that what you all are doing is, is creating gratitude towards the water. And gratitude is a, a way of recognizing gifts. And so since we don't usually do that, I think it's very important, all three of you, how you have created these different ways of thanking the water and acknowledging and knowing it because we are polluting it because we are not grateful to it because we don't recognize it as a gift. And so it, the gratitude at, that you all are continually demonstrating is, is so important in changing the attitude towards the sea, towards the springs, towards the rain, all of those nourishing gifts that come to us in water. So thank you so much, all three. It was very beautiful. So um, Liliana. Yes. Uh, there's a comment and a question for Guadalupe. Uh, um, this was uh, for Guadalupe and for Aria. This was a beautiful meditation and song. I'd like to ask you for your perspective on destructive waters such as Hurricane Ian that so many of us are dealing with. Who would like to go first? Well, um, uh, you know, um, water is separate because it's always taking the way it needs to move and to go. In this connection that water have with another element in, in the universe, like the winds, and in our rage too, and all our disconnection, um, we are having the transformation of the of the nature can be really hard for us because we are not connected with. And if we are not connected, of course, we have to suffer the results of the movement of the elements of nature, which is you know if we are building houses in the ways. In, in, in the where the water goes, if we are building houses in front of the sea and we don't, we forgot that the sea is just going ahead and moving always. I think, um, of course, water has this face, this face of destruction, but it's just the face of life. Life is like that. Something have. So it's, it's transforming always. Something is dying and, and destructed and new things are coming again. If we understand that as a, process, a normal process of our lives, we can understand that water is just following a, its natural way. I don't know if I understood well the, what you have said and if I answered, I said, I hope so. Thank you, Guadalupe. Aria, do you have any uh, wisdom words or do you want to share? Um, I think that was a question by, um, was it uh, maybe uh, Salkana Schindler? And it was a, a great question because it's a part of the, um, the struggle, I think, right now in humanity is with like our emotion, our energy in motion, our waters. And it is very reflective 
in what is going on with climate change and also how um, different organizations treat water more as a, a, a belonging that is taken advantage of rather than um, the relation of respectful uh, family. So there are many there are many different ways to talk and speak with water from many cultures. Um, I could just offer a couple from, I would say, uh, my African lineage. And as uh, uh, Maria had, had, had spoke of Yemaya, Yemaya, the uh, mother ocean, um, I had danced for before, um, I was asked to dance for her. And, you know, in uh, that particular tradition, there is like almost um, a seeming possession, right, of the water. Uh, and, and the dancer, she dances, that one that um, is embodying it, she dances until she's spent. That, way, that is a, a particular way of offering, whether it is to actually the ocean or um, upset in the emotional body of the people, the community. And so the, the a priestess of Yamaya uh, would offer herself to enact with the drums, with the pulse of the waters that were angry and dance until it was spent. Um, that's one way I have seen. Uh, my personal um, approach to water that seems damaging is, is much like um, Guadalupe was saying that, you know, a part of the nature of life the whole of it is we have the deep and viscous that can sometimes seem torrential, and then we have the uh, the the flowing um, light that that is the complement of it. And that I mean, I offer all prayers of love, 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 and compassion to the waters for the people that have suffering from the torrential waters. And um, we are a species that is learning to be more uh, in reciprocity with all of the elements. Water being one of uh, the, I feel the most important um, so that we, we can respect it in a way that our houses are built in a certain way in certain places that are not necessarily in that flow zone of when the earth's body that knows its own body is regulating and then we these little creatures we get to work with mother on how she's regulating so i offer prayers and when it seems like there is a violence i also reflect in myself what violences i have been exposed to what violences i have thought or created um, throughout life, and and I make an honest ho'opono pono in the uh, Hawaiiana tradition of Namia Hawaii hula halau that I was taught um, with a I am sorry, please forgive me, thank you, and I love you. This is not just words or something to like take from a particular uh, culture. This is an embodiment of who we are. And so I would say reciprocity is, is a, a good place to start in prayer. Thanks, Maria. Uh, Maria, did you have any, uh, any words that you would want to input to that? Oh, yes. You brought me right back to my younger <laughs> years again, because my parents were called the crazy uh, parents of the neighborhood, because every time we had a hurricane in Puerto Rico, we who lived part of the year in the, near the ocean and part of the year near the city, my, when everybody would come from the shoreline because there was gonna be a hurricane coming, my parents would pack us up and we would go on the opposite way to the shoreline and prepare to uh, receive the hurricane in the shoreline. It was amazing because that is how they showed us to be able to, con I don't know if I can call it control, but to recognize our fear 
and deal with it by preparing for things that we could not control, but that we have to prepare. And it was, I lit five of them between the time when I was five and 15, five hurricanes in the shoreline. And believe me, if anything that we understood and thank God the crazy parents that we had is the connection precisely of what both Guadalupe and Aria have also said about the way in which the hurricane is a natural phenomenon of clean, the planet cleansing itself. And we saw it because we were in the shoreline and after the hurricane, that we survived the hurricane, if we survived it, everything was so clean. Everything was so clean of all the garbage that people put into it. But my father being an engineer, we used to prepare our house and we, we would stay in hammocks hanging from the ceiling of the house because the water would come into the house and go out again. And my father was the constructor of the house. That's one, one advantage that everybody in the world has to have a father who's an engineer that can construct his own house. I mean, so what he would do after that with my mother is we would get on small boats and go around the neighborhood helping. And it was amazing to us to get in rowboats and going on the streets in boats to get people from the roofs of their ceilings and help them to get out to a safe place. Why? Because we learn to make the connection about understanding that the hurricane was gonna have its way and we could prepare to be able to overcome it. And if not, we had to go to a safe place because people who don't have what we had were living in precarious conditions where they were the ones that were taking the biggest brunt of the planet cleansing itself. It was an amazing experience. I still, to this day, tell the story time after time, and I don't have a half hour now to tell you what it feels like when you see it coming from the horizon and you hear the silence and all of nature going underground and silencing, and we would be quiet and listen to the wind, and then it would pass through and coming back to life again slowly but surely. I don't have a half hour to tell you, but it's an experience that taught us so much of what we had to do and what we could not do in light of nature taking its way to cleanse itself. And it's really devastating that the ones who have to live in the places where you get the hurricane, the worst part of the hurricanes, where you get the worst part of earthquakes and so on of the people that have been dispossessed or people for example in Florida I see it and I have seen it time after time so many people having to live in Florida because that's where you have warm weather and so people move there and then people who have lived there moving to um, the shoreline the very shoreline so it's ha the havoc that we have that has been created because of a, 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 a global a policy that doesn't take into account that we cannot control all of nature and all of the planet. And that the people that are taking the worst part of it are the people that have been dispossessed of what they have had historically. Thanks, Maria. I, yes, I think it's really important that we have to understand the ways in which the land and the elements around us are changing in their cycles as the events of climate change begin to heat up. And I think it's very challenging for humans because we want to have this sense of constancy that isn't in alignment necessarily with um, the larger forces of, of the natural world. And I think that's what the indigenous people have um, going for them are these, it is the understanding of the relationship of our humanity, our humanness with the land and all the forces of nature to observe the patterns as they change because they have changed everywhere in the United States. They're not the same as they were 20 years ago or even six years ago. 
So, uh, um, and we keep wanting to um, create solutions based on six years ago when the world isn't the same as it was six years ago. No. That's our challenge. Our challenge is not being able to be present with what is right now, accessing all the skill and wisdom that we've amassed in our history to apply it to the present moment. So um, I want to encourage us to just really listen carefully to the land and the elements where you live and be safe wherever you are and do everything that you possibly can to attend to those needs. Because as you can see, the infrastructures in the world are not prepared for where we are. You know, we, we unfortunately or fortunately participate in preparing or forcing in many cases, our government to make change. We would like them to have forethought in that direction, but it doesn't seem that way often. So thank you for those very full answers. And um, Maria, I'm grateful that you survived five hurricanes. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Liliana, you have uh, more for us, please. Yes, uh, I have a comment for all the panelists from Marta Benavides from El Salvador. So Marta Benavides says, salud, gracias for such meaningful, meaningful, informative, educational, historical, spiritual meditation. Today, we must make peace with nature, water, a key aspect clearly. We know one day water will be considered more valuable and costly than oil because of the scarcity and also life-giving power of water. And also we can see the water and drought crisis and the floods that afflict so many nations. Today, we must pay attention as humanity should have paid all along. The new multipolar world order already being let us be about this. Marta Benavides, El Salvador. This thank is for you. all the panelists. Yes, thank you for those beautiful words, Marta. Um, does anyone wish to comment back to Marta? Have any words to share? Jen, do you have anything you'd like to well, say? Yeah. I wanted, uh, I just Go wanted ahead. to say previ on the previous discussion is that there are people that say that Mother Earth is angry at us and that uh, we should be afraid of her. But I, I don't think that. I think that her heart is broken. I think that we're part in a, a beautiful part of the Earth, but we haven't recognized ourselves as the kind of maternal species that I think we are. And, uh, and that these disasters that we have incurred are the breaking of the heart of nature, not her anger or her any kind of um, punishment. Mm. That's what I wanted to say. Yeah, I, I agree, um, Genevieve. I, I have always felt that we all self-regulate in the manner that is most helpful and most um, uh, if possible in the most nourishing way and yet sometimes that can seem violent to others right how we as an individual um, go about self-regulation can sometimes be seen as violence as madness especially women especially the earth herself representative of all women can be seen as dangerous as the monster that's going to come get you that is um out for retribution when there is this ease in the self then there's something that comes forth to help us self-regulate and i i like to think that mother 
you know, Madre do Mundo, that the earth is much wiser <laughs> than I could hope to be. And so I listened to her. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that it is a part of her self-regulation, um, which could be anything from how she feels emotionally, um, how she thinks in her many, many processes. You know, I, I think of all of the systems that our mother actually gets to maneuver and navigate all at once. The water, the air, you know, the land mass, all of it. So um, I think honestly, a few tidal waves and hurricanes and uh, lava, which is more like in Hawaii and in in Shasta, you know, like the places with mountains that have had um, volcanoes. And I still, with all of that, I, for me personally, I feel that honoring and gratitude the waters is a helpful way to offer uh, my compassion and understanding of nature um, self-regulating. So that is, uh, that's what I think. <laughs> Thanks, Maria. Maria, you, you have your hand up, so please. And I I agree with everything that has been said, but I remember Elizabeth Tahotiorus putting it to me in an interview that I did with Fire at the Earth Summit in 1991. That was so amazing. It changed my perception. Uh, she explains that the planet, the living planet, has as one of its ways of recovering its equilibrium or maintaining its equilibrium historically has been to get rid of species that harm harm it, um, its equilibrium in a way that would be destructive of the whole of life in the planet. And when she explained that, that it's, you know, and she said, you know, dinosaurs died out because they ate everything on the top of all of the trees. And so, you know, it's the planet, um, uh, getting rid of the species that damage its equilibrium in, in a way that can damage all of life. It's like, you know, the planet Earth looks after all of life, not in little pieces and fragments, all of life in equilibrium. And so anybody who destroys that equilibrium by thinking that they are the best of the whole planet, that they are the main species. No, I really believe that now we have reached our biological limit as a species to be in the planet. And I don't know if it's that the planet is angry, maybe it is, or I'm sure that it could be. It would be, I would be, I am when I am threatened by anybody who destroys, try to destroy my equilibrium. Thank God I react. And it is a way that it has as one of its mechanisms to be able to deal with recovering its this equilibrium and if there is a species that has threatened today to destroy the equilibrium of the planet it is the human species we are the ones who are threatened to disappear that's what i believe and so therefore we better change and talking back about marta thank you marta speaking from el salvador i learned in el salvador during the war that when human beings are in face of life and death, we can make an about face. We can make a 180 degree or 360 degree change in our lives when we feel threatened. We have to understand that we are, have reached the biological threshold to be able to continue living as, as a, here as a species. And I know that we would change because we are not suicidal. It's just that, you know, it's just that we have been trained as a human species by educational system and by everything, the way patriarchal and and market economy has has, um, organized the mainstream world that everything can be turned into money. And therefore, if you have money to buy, then you can do anything. And if you create enough power over the planet 
we're going to be so powerful that the planet is going to knee on us. That's very patriarchal and it doesn't work with women and it doesn't work with the planet. Thank you, Maria. Absolutely. Jen. Well, I think we are a gift giving species, a maternal species and the market, uh, patriarchy and capitalism are parasitic on us. Mm -hmm. We have to dissolve that parasite and come forward as a gift-giving species as a host instead of the parasite and gain our, our our independence everyone because that we have both of those aspects in ourselves now we've we become that too so but we can and we are really homo donans not homo sapiens because we don't even know of the harm we're causing and what's wrong with us. So that's Thank you, Jen. Liliana, is there more? Yes, I have a oh, question. Sorry, if I can interrupt, Guadalupe has her hand up to speak. Oh, sorry. sorry. Guadalupe, yes. Uh, no, uh, of course, listening about that, I, I, I just only thinking in this way, this polarized way we see the life. It's, it's, it's the result of the system where we live. The, the patriarchy founded that, you know. Um, just read Platon. I don't know how to say that in English. Platon, right. Platon, just read it. Right. It's the, right. the, the, the culture. And, 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 it's, and it's, it's really sad, you know. But anyway, we from different places of thinking and doing, we are receiving at this moment, we women are receiving this invitation to lose the, the fear of being ourselves in connection with earth. And, and it, yeah. we are invited to take this beautiful challenge of building a better world. Um, I look for, um, I'm always listening and trying to find the right questions that guide me to the answers. Uh, there are many answers as different cultures, but there is only one absolute situation in the world is that the, the, the energy of this planet and the whole universe is moving always. If we forget that and trying to stay in a place and we don't move just to be sure, just to have my security, just to have a house that is not going to fall, you know, anyway, uh, forget it, forget it. That's not the lesson of earth. It's, it's teaching, when I see the forest that I have in front of my house, I want to talk about diversity. Oh my God, that is diversity. Really, <laughs> different kind of trees, light and darkness together creating light. When people is talking to me about enlightenment, I said, oh, you know, what I see in the forest where I live is that in the dark is really the life coming up when, where you don't see. Why? That's why in the tropical lands, the underworld was very important, very important. When the Spanish people came, they were talking about the, 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 the hail. We didn't know what was that. I mean, there they are seven, seven steps, nine steps to go down to the underworld. The nine months that a human being needs to come out to the light. Knowing that, the only thing I, I, I really, I'm so sorry that my, my family never teach me to walk in a tightrope, you know? That's, I, I always think that the circus is the better answer for life. <laughs> Living in the risk, in the limit, moving always, trying to dance to, to have the balance in life. And when we understand that life is moving always, that the energy is moving always, there is nothing. I mean, the earth is running around the universe, around this solar system. What are we doing now with this way of trying to be in a place to be safe? There is no safe place for any one of us. There is a place to live the life and to run in the life with all the risks and all the happiness that the life offers to us. There is no another way because life is a gift, exactly. And gifts are not to understand, it's just to enjoy. Mysteries are just to enjoy, to, to learn always. 
But this panic to be always in front of the of the challenge, you know, it is hard. It's hard, especially in a society that is not giving to us the tools to to see the life and live the life in that way. But that is one of the most beautiful challenge that we women have. That gives me a lot of power just to, when I see that, I, I didn't read that in a book. I understood that when I was 10 years in my life, looking the water when it was falling. And I saw always passing in little rivers, different things, never anything was repeated in this line. Nothing was repeated in that line. I mean, that is the deep philosophy that nature is teaching us in the Arctic, in the desert, in everywhere. So um, I think this is a fantastic invitation. It's a fantastic invitation for us as women to say, hey, dears, we have answers. We have experience in our bodies. We have experience in our fight that we have had all these years. Use this, use this to change. To, yeah. Thank you, Guadalupe. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, confirming agreement and acknowledgement of your words. Um, Liliana, is there more for yes. us here? I have a, a, a comment and a question from Mariana Valenzuela. And she says to all the panelists, I am so inspired by the three panelists. I would like to know how and from where do you get this deep connection from nature? And what inspires you to do the work that the three of you are doing? Where do you get this? Ah, oh, sorry, sorry. C can you re repeat again? Yeah. Sometimes I lose a word and I lose everything. No problem. I can totally repeat it. I can even tell it to you in Spanish if you would like. Ah, please, please, please. Yeah. Estoy muy inspirada por, los tres, por las tres panelistas. Quisiera saber de dónde y de y cómo tienen esta profunda conexión con la naturaleza y qué las inspira a hacer este trabajo. Pero lo, creo que lo que más importante que esté está preguntando es where, de dónde están sacando esta conexión. Anybody else need me to um, to repeat it? Could you translate that into German, please? Oh, I'm kidding. I, that's, I, <laughs> I can do French, but not German. Okay. okay, okay, just kidding. But thank you, thank you, Liliana. That was beautiful. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I, I oh, asked yes. before. I, I felt that it was an important question. I needed just to know exactly. You know, it's very important. Would you like to go first, Guadalupe, in answering that question? Then, um, when I was younger, I thought that I was very important, very intelligent, and fantastic. I mean, I am still, but that's a gift. That's a gift. I know that every person, each one of us on earth has the capability and has, we have the skills to develop a connection with nature. Of mm. course, we can forget that and we can lose that. I'm so happy. I think that I have that connection because I come from a family um, with an agricultural tradition. Um, people from a little village connected with agriculture. And so, and on the other side, and the other side, I think is um, that is a strength that we, and we women especially have that connection. We can make that connection very easy. I think so, because, um, and this is, a, is something that I know that many people uh, don't like, they, they don't like to talk about this, but I think that our biological condition permitted, permit to us to develop a kind of knowledge and um, related with how to preserve life how to organize our life, 
how to pay attention to, to preserve life. Uh, and it doesn't matter uh, with, with being mother or no, you can be or no, it's just a condition, a condition. And I always see that in animals, a lot of female uh, mammals, I can see that it's just a kind of um, condition that we have. I got that. So I always um, give thanks to that. I appreciate that a lot. And I take care of that connection. Uh, that's what I see. And I think everyone who feels that they need that connection with nature, don't forget that you are nature. Then you don't have to go back to nature. You are nature. Just think in what kind of nature you are. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Guadalupe. Aria, are you feeling ready to respond? Actually, I wish you could hear the, um, there's a group of uh, Machico women here who are singing and drumming right now in the pavilion. I wish you could hear that because it's very beautiful. Um, they came last night uh, to prepare for a, a morning uh, a ceremony. And, you know, everything that Juan Rupe just said, I feel totally in resonance with. And everything that Maria said right before it, I, I resonate with because it's like, one of the things that was shown to me when I was a toddler, which confused me, and I found a lot of pain um, in adolescent years because I was I was receiving different information from these institutional organizations that were working more in entrainment of a species rather than um, the nourishment of a being, and. Um, when somebody says, how do you have this relationship? I instantly feel a connection with them in the question itself, because that feels like nature rising up to question this um, insanity, really. That feels like insanity that is imprinted on us um, as children. Um, and so our children are carted off to these places for the first seven years when we're just recording, recording in theta, like in that, in that theta realm. And then we work and work for the rest of our lives in practicing and repetition to rewire ourselves, um, to, to, to remember what we instinctively know is that we are nature. It's not for others to say, what our nature is. This is the, the grand exploration of living. And um, I do believe that it is an innate quality in all beings in the human species. It's just been suppressed for so long that there's a confusion on how to get there. So me personally, uh, my answer to that question is, um, I found a connection with uh, nature and the waters very young in life. My mother um, was a Caucasian woman um, on a scholarship to uh, Mount Holyoke College. So one of the first uh, women's colleges in uh, the late sixties. And um, she went against what her family thought was right. Um, they were uh, Louisiana <clears throat> plantation owner stock and she married somebody who was um african-american which was not done then and it was not appreciated and she was pushed out of it when she went to this school uh, mount holyoke in particular uh how she uh, supplemented income was she worked in the greenhouse and i was a very um lucky child because i was brought to that greenhouse every day um, they let me uh, uh, stay with my mother while she worked. And so I feel that that greenhouse, which was represented of uh, the, the microcosmic with the macro of, of how plants grow together, what is the permaculture of that place, this, this little house 
right, that is of 1,700 different species, it sang to me. When the water would come out of the misters uh, with the sunlight and it would touch the plants, the song would change. And somehow I understood. And I thought, am I crazy? Like was I started to 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 get older, and I realized this was just the um, this the symbiosis that happens when nature and nurturing the reciprocity of that gift of the gift of water of the gift of growing and knowing we grow into the internal knowing the wholeness that is the self that rises up to ask a question. How do you make this connection? Why did you make this connection? Because there's a resonance in the other person that's not othering. It's actually so compatible and um, wonderful to, to, to make the connection that actually helps to um, um, strengthen to strengthen the chrysalis of each being in connection to Mother Earth, with Mother Earth, not just on top of her, but integrally breathing with her. So um, I, I found my my connection in a in a very in a greenhouse with many plants. That's beautiful. Well, that is the the uh, urban. Uh, experience of an agricultural community. That's that's what has happened. <laughs> so your connection with Guadalupe and her lineage and your lineage are very simpatico. Maria, would you like to respond to that? Where do you get your connection? Where did you get your connection? Well, um, I'm still asking that myself for myself, but not how I got it because I already explained to you how very early on in life, I had the privilege of going in a trance in the middle of the ocean and becoming or understanding or accepting or being conscious that that was part of me and I was part of that. That, that I, what I ask myself now is how in God's or the goddess's name did I keep it for so many years to be <laughs> there at 74 with so much bullshit education, bullshit <laughs> policies, bullshit stuff that could eh, eh, enagenate, no, eso no es una palabra, eh, that could um, disconnect me to a connection that um, I learned. You know, let me just give you the example of the hurricane again, because it's very critical to understand what I was trying to say about overcoming fear and being yourself in the hurricanes. In the last hurricane that I lived with my mother, which was Hurricane Maria five years ago, I had to go to Puerto Rico. You know, before I used to go when I was a kid to the city, from the city to the shoreline with my parents and everybody to face the hurricanes. This time I was asked by my brothers and sisters to come to Puerto Rico because I was the only one that could convince my mother who was living in the same house where we faced five hurricanes when we were kids, she didn't want to leave and go to the city when the Hurricane Maria was announced and that was going to destroy our house. I ne we never believed that our house was indestructible. We believed that we had to face nature where it was at to be able to learn the lessons that we learned. That's what they believed and they put us through and it was great. But with Hurricane Maria, I had to go and I had to convince my mother that uh, she had to leave the house and we had to go to the city. She had never gone to a city. And now she was 96, 95, 96, yes. And she didn't want, she said, are you telling me I'm going to die here? Then I'll die here. But I'm not leaving. We left. She finally con was convinced to leave. And the next day we came and there was a lot less damage than the hurricane that had come a few, a few months before. I can't even remember the name of the previous one. It, it, so, anyway, so we came back and nothing was destroyed in our house where we had grown up. And my mother said, why did you make me leave? I, you know, I knew I could stay here. And it wasn't about the house, but I had to ask about the house. 
And I have a story that I'm going to send to you because it's an amazing story about the role of the coral reef in front of my house and how that symbiosis played out in what my neighbor told me happened in front of my house so that it wouldn't be destroyed. And what happened, and I'll tell you that symbiosis in two seconds, the reef is so strong that when the waves came, they would break up really high, 50 meters away from the shoreline. And the wind of the hurricane threw it back into the deep ocean and not let it come into my house where I was born, where my mother wanted to die and where she died. So it's not about having strong houses. It's not about being so great, you know. It's about always learning from the lessons that nature has to teach us. If we fly away from nature, we are nature and we're never going to be able to learn anything, nothing, only mind, 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 knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. And if it's not associated, it's not gonna get us anywhere. So I still ask myself, how have I kept it so strong that it's been indestructible by the health system, by the educational system, by all of the systems that mm -hmm. I have gone through and have learned a lot, but not because I stayed and believed them but because I put them through the eye of my own nature and the rest of nature that I belong to. And my mother taught me to honor my own nature, to be myself. And that's what the part of the knowledge that can allow you to have, uh, be true to yourself and therefore to nature. Mm. Mm. Thanks, Maria. That is very beautiful. Um, I'll just share uh, just a little bit. You know, I see Darsha is here with us. And Darsha, I think you'll appreciate this. You know, I have always, I have never not been connected. And I, I often wondered about this until many years later. And I started reading about, um, you know, attachment theory and childhood development. Um, and Guadalupe, when you were talking about safety, you know, I, I don't know if there was a consciousness of safety, but what I recognize in, in growing up, I have always felt that I belonged as a child of the earth. And I attribute that to uh, the beingness of my, my parents and my family. We were humble in our, in, in our upbringing, but the sense of me being in the world grounded um because of course i was well not of course you some of you may not know this my parents came to the united states so i come from an in immigrant family which means that i am on land that is not uh the true nature of my uh, indigenous roots but what i recognized in this sense of wholeness and belonging was that my parents made our home connected to the home that they came from. So they attended to the earth. They, uh, they had respect for the water. They learned about the different nature of the weather. Um, they augmented the earth. And even before I knew what permaculture was to really attend to the soil, you know, make soil. I grew up in a desert and they created a tropical microclimate where bananas and papayas and mangoes grew and you know all kinds of asian fruit but that had to do with the love that they extended and the relationship that they had with the land so i think that we have the capacity no matter what our heritage is is to re-indigenize, you know, to, to be indigenous to the land means to be connected to the land, the land that you're on. And um, I think that for me, what made it be full circle where I feel really grounded was the awareness of how the water flows. You know, I'm an island person. So the water flows, the ocean from the salt, you know, as it actually, rises up in the rain and then it comes down through uh, the water table and gets sifted so that we have fresh water to drink. In my understanding of the flow of water then we're connected 
to all places on the planet, not just through the soil, but also through the water. So I think that's, you know, a little secret that you could just perhaps meditate on yourself to recognize that you, you know, we all are, as Guadalupe says, we are nature. We are part of nature. As Aria said, we are water and we have water and we are of water. And as Maria says that we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility um, as two-legged beings to participate in uh, the goodness on the planet, to, to make it a better place than it was before we came and to recognize our roots, no matter how far away they seem or how many generations. I was, I was listening to um, something before I got on this call today and uh, the, the topic was elders and they were talking about generations. And in common usage of the term generations, that's 25 years because, um, people before us didn't live very long. So, so a generation might be considered 25 years. And when we think of generations, you know, then you actually think of uh, how long we have lived. And, you know, we have many different ways that we can connect both through the waters to the land itself. And um, it truly is a gift. It truly is a gift. And I'm doing a time check because it's um, 1259 now, but I, I was hoping that we'd be able to have some song offerings before we actually ended our call. So um, Maria says that she needs to leave. So Maria, can you just pop out and wave to us goodbye? And I'll maybe Guadalupe and Aria can actually have a song for us. So. Maria, take really good care, and we'll see you next time. And Guadalupe, would you uh, want to offer if a song? If we go into the songs, I'll listen to the songs and then run out. OK, OK. So Guadalupe, would you like to offer a song for us? This is a song talking about water. Water you don't need to drink, let it drown sliding down the hills, up is running through the plains, carries in the plants, flows the water, carries in the plants, carries in everything. Um, I will try to... Bajando por los cerros, corriendo por los llanos, Besando los sembrados, va el agua, pintando con sus peces los ríos y los mares, dándole el color verde a los árboles, dándole el color verde al pasto, agua que nos debe ver. Déjala correr, déjala que corra libre y limpia por tus manos, agua que no has de beber, sí, ay, déjala correr, déjala que vaya al mar y el sol la lleve al cielo, déjala que vaya al mar y el sol la lleve al cielo. Con que lavas tu cara, niña, qué linda estás, me lavo con agua clara y el sol pone lo más si el río está muy sucio no habrá más aguas claras ni habrá vida en la tierra sin agua ni habrá vida en la tierra sin agua y agua que no has de beber déjala correr Déjala que corra libre y limpia por tus manos, agua que no has de beber, si sí. ay, déjala correr. Déjala que vaya al mar y el sol la lleve al cielo, déjala que vaya al mar y el sol la lleve al cielo. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. And Guadalupe, thank you so much, Guadalupe. 
so beautiful. And a, yes, very beautiful. Aria, would you like to sing a song before we actually close and, and uh, sing yeah, us out? I'm, I feel like I'm still writing Guadalupe. That was beautiful. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Guadalupe and Maria. This has been a, a true honor and pleasure to be able to be here with you and Jen and Leticia and all of the beautiful women on this um, this call. I just say thank you. Um, I would like to offer a song that is actually from my childhood uh, that felt very important to me because it honors the elements. It honors water and our mother earth. And um, you, maybe you know, maybe you don't know, but I offer um, breaths which was by uh, Sweet Honey and the Rock. Listen more often to things than to beings. Listen more often to things than to beings. Tis the ancestor's breath when the fire's voice is heard. Tis the ancestor's breath and the voice of the waters. Um, those who have died have never never left the dead are not under the earth they're in the rustling trees they're in the groaning woods they're in the crying grass they are in the moony rocks the dead are not under the earth listen more often to things than to beings. Listen more often to things than to beings. Tis the ancestor's breath when the voice, when the fire's voice is heard. Tis the ancestor's breath in the voice of the waters. Ah, those who have died have never never left the dead of a pact with the living they are in the woman's breast they are in the wailing child they are with us in our homes they are with us in this crowd the dead of a pact with the living listen more often to things than to beings. Listen more often to things than to beings. Tis the ancestor's breath when the fire's voice is heard. Tis the ancestor's breath in the voice of the waters. Ah, Thank you so much for that. I want to just thank uh, Maria Suarez, Guadalupe Urbina, and Reverend Aria Marie Sharp for being with us today. It's been so beautiful. I know the waters are happy. I'm very happy. It seems like our audience is very happy. Those of you who were with us today, and I hope those of you who are enjoying the recording. Thank you, Genevieve Vaughn and the International Feminists for a Gift Economy for always supporting these salons. Diane, Elena for the tech support and Liliana for the questions. We are so pleased that you were with us today. Please join us in two weeks, October the 15th for our salon number 37. This, this uh, session is being recorded and you can watch it again on the maternal gifteconomymovement.org. We really do welcome your comments and your questions. If you'd like to send them to us, you can always write to us at the maternal gift economy at gmail.com. We'll see you in two weeks, October the 15th. Please stay safe, be well, be kind to one another, and remember to thank the water. Bye for now. <laughs>